Hello and welcome to DM's Guide. On today's episode, we're going to look at the Cold Blood Killer quest, how to put some life into the NPC Civic Cultural, and just how do you put Taurus Caravan into your campaign. At the end of this episode, we're going to go through the comments section, read the best comments from the week, and I'll see you shortly. This episode is all about the Cold Hearted Killer quest. So first things first, I'm going to discuss Taurus Caravan. Who's in Taurus Caravan? and why Sephic Caltro is a villain in this campaign. So let's jump in, so who is within Taurus Caravan? Taurus Caravan consists of six different characters. You have Torga Icefane, who is the bandit captain boss, and she runs Taurus Caravan to deliver goods to various towns within Icewind Dale. Solely here for the profit, and she's not the most likeable person. She sells her goods for an incredibly high price, and if she can, she's even happy to kill for some money. She has four employees, except from Civic Caltro, which are four bandits, and each of these bandits are responsible for looking after her dog sleds and selling her wares. Civic Caltro, her bodyguard, has a different story altogether. He was a sailor that came from Luskin, who was dying in the sea of moving ice. His skull was cannibalized by the spirit of a frost druid who was smitten for all the frost maiden. This frustrated soul has taken over Sephix Caltro's body and made him an undead monstrosity who is going through Icewind Dale to deliver justice in Oral's name. What he's doing is he's killing anyone who bribes local authorities so they don't take part in the local lotteries where they're sacrificed to Oral the Frost Maiden, which your player characters would have heard out when they got this quest from Helen Trollblade. So with this encounter, the main thing you have is potentially six enemies. However, they will have their own agenda. These bandits are here for money, and from my understanding, the way I run them in a fight is if they're scared, they're going to run. Your player characters will have the upper hand in this encounter, they can prepare, and they can do their research. In the worst case scenario, they're going to be up against everyone, and this could be a deadly encounter. From my experience, you should not do this encounter at level 1, you should do this preferably at level 3 or even level 2. If you do it later on in the campaign when your player character is level 4, it'll be awfully easy. This encounter can take place anywhere in Icewind Dale, and it's up to the DM to choose when to do it. The way I typically run the encounter is that your player characters will be going from town to town doing different odd jobs. I'd either have them meet Taurus Caravan outside of a town, or perhaps Sephix band and entourage arrives while they're resting and they meet them in the morning. Torga Icefane will be well known with in 10 towns, and the town speakers here have their own communities. Each of these 10 towns operate independently from each other, and because of this, I believe they would be quite defensive and they wouldn't allow this merchant caravan to actually get within the town. However, as a DM, you can choose to use this information how you see fit. One of the reasons I did this for is just mechanically, as it's a lot easier to make a battle map outside of a 10 town than have it within. However, due to having the 10 towns here and the whole idea of stealing and trading and the likelihood that if you're caught stealing or trading, if no one survives to find out, I think theft would be very common within 10 towns. And because of this, I would have Taurus Caravan be close enough to a city such as Brandsander, where there will be witnesses if Taurus gets robbed by bandits or members of various other towns. So what happens if your player characters rob Taurus Caravan, they kill them in the street, what repercussions are they? Well, if they think far ahead and they ambush Torg's caravan, let's say in the east way, where it's incredibly far from Goodmead and from East Haven, approximately four miles on the tundra, they'll be known to see what happens, so the most likely they get away scot-free, unless they sell something that can be identified. I think it's very good if you have you introduce Torg's caravan just outside of town, and it means that if everything goes wrong and they kill bandits left and right, it means that the town themselves have to think ahead and defend themselves. For instance, I had a party of players who decided to attack Taurus Caravan in broad daylight directly outside of Targos. Because of this, the townspeople and the speaker of Targos decided that the party wasn't allowed to go there anymore because they're too much of a threat. And this shows that your player characters have repercussions to their actions. So you can deal with this scenario in many ways. As we have Sephic, he's going to go into these 10 towns at night time by himself. And this is when your player characters could surprise him. So it'll be a party against one individual. So with Sephic's garb, you can see that 
for this weather and just how he's not walking around with thick furs. This is distinct. This should be giving your players clues that Sefik is not a normal man, as a normal man will be freezing wearing this attire. If you deal with Sefik Kaltro by himself, that is the easiest situation your player characters get in. With my experience, I would definitely prepare the town this will happen in. So as a DM, you have time to prepare. So let's say Sefik is outside of Brand Sander. You have Tor's caravan outside, outside these walls, and he's going to go in to have a drink. You know, realistically, the only tavern in this town will be the North Look, and that's a place that you could prepare. And what I did with this, with these taverns in the Ten Towns, is just have a default map of a normal tavern, and you can put it in when you see fit. You also know where he will go afterwards. So it says in the description that he's going to sleep in perhaps a barn or in the cold. But Bransander is the busiest town within Ten Towns. So what I do with him is he'll simply sleep in the street. But the main thing is this, you need to decide what town you want to introduce Sefik and prep accordingly for him. As in, if you just show him up as a random encounter, your player characters will invest time. And as a DM, you need to invest time for your players. And again, with this, if you want to make it very easy, what you can do is have Sefik in a smaller town as Bremen, as I've used in the previous episodes, as it's small and worse comes to worst, if there's a full attack, there's not many guards to defend Bremen, which means that your player characters most likely can run away scot-free. And you also know exactly the tavern that Sefik will go to, which is Bird Treasures Inn, and you can introduce Core Melfin in her quest. In my experience with running this professionally, I always find that the player characters don't want to deal with the cities. They want to take Tor's caravan out on the tundra. And what you need to understand is that Tor's caravan consists of three dog sleds. You have Torga's dog sled, which she'll be with Sefik, that's her bodyguard. And you have two other dog sleds. So with Torga and her caravan, Torg's an outdoor shop. So with these three dogs, as I mentioned previously, one of these sleds will contain provisions and supplies for Torga, her team and her dogs. And I choose this one that Torg is riding on. This will also have Torga's treasure. And with Torga's treasure, she keeps all her proceeds in a small locked iron strong box on her dog sled. And this will contain 92 gold pieces, 75 silver pieces, 125 copper pieces, and 7 gemstones worth 10 gold pieces each. Because of this treasure box on her sled, one of the notable things about Torga is that she has a key around her neck. Also, if your players sneak into this caravan and these bandits, Torga or Sefik, are unaware, however, that'll be quite tricky because Sefik's got quite a high pass perception, they'll also find that in one of the larger sacks on Torga's sled, this one right here, you'll find what appears to be the body of a half elf in his 30s with a stab wound in his chest. And that's one way you can introduce to your player characters that Torga is actually quite evil. Torga found him and killed him with Sefik's help, and once she sold off all her goods in Ten Town, she plans to deliver this corpse to Luskin and collect the bounty. So up to yourself if you continue with this, as in to leave Icewind Dale will be very tricky. But that's something your player characters might do after they conclude the campaign. With these other two dog sleds, what you'll notice is that your player characters might look for different wares to buy because there's not many things to buy within Ten Towns. So these two sleds will contain cut wood, flint and tinder, flask of oil, oil blankets, furs, rations, bottles of wine, cases of cheap ale, fake medicines and poison. With your poison, since it is typically used for killing vermin, I would just use the information you would get within Dungeon Master's Guide. Make it nice and straightforward. But the main thing you need to discuss with these items is that these items are stolen. So if your player characters are going over these sleds, get them to an investigation check, they'll see that you recognize some of these items from different 10 towns and perhaps you can use this as a hook to help certain 10 towns to come to your aid and help your tours caravan if you're more invested in a political game rather than just simply kill everything. However, in my experience, it will never end that way, as in it will be a full-blown brawl. So let's explain how you'd play Torgai's Fane, Sephic Cultural, and these bandits in combat. So first things first, I'll discuss these bandits. These bandits are here for money, which means if they're more scared of your player characters than Torga and Sephic, they're going to run away. They have low armor class, low hit points, and for me, I would say that they care about their life. So they're going to fire at range with their crossbow, and they're going to run and keep their distance. They'll only get into melee combat with their scimitar if they see one player character that is wounded, and they'll take their chances. 
Another thing I did with these bandits, just to give them more variety, was they're always covered in thick furs because of how incredibly cold Icewind Dale is. So what I had was when a player character discovered and came up close, these bandits never spoke. They simply pointed. And after they defeat them, or perhaps if they slash them in combat, their face masks would drop and you realise that these bandits have their mouths sewn shut. Just because I run Torg a bit more evil than it's written in the book, it also gives them more mystery and just the sheer terror of how it's easy to hide such terrible acts. But also another thing you could do is you could sneak a doppelganger in here and add a bit more murder mystery into the campaign. But that's up to yourselves. How would you deal with Torgai's thing? Well, Torgai's thing in combat, she's actually quite a substantial foe. She has high hit points of 65. If you're dealing with level 1 player, level 2 characters, on and on, she'll take them quite comfortably. She has a parry ability, which will increase her armor class to 17. She also has a multi attack. But the main thing with this is she cares about herself and she cares about her life. She'll only help Sephic if she believes she'll win the battle. If they're surprised and all of the heat's going to Sephic, she's definitely going to run away. So we'll do three melee attacks. She'll do with two of the same turn, one of her dagger. And again, I wouldn't run her in melee unless she really has to. So she'll be constantly doing two range attacks with her daggers. And because of the way Torgor Icefin has explained in the book, I would have her be very mean. As you can see, she's going to target the weakest player character first, just due to her cruel mentality. Before I talk about Sephic, I'm going to talk about how these bandits and Torga's going to flee. So my understanding is that if these bandits think they can run with all the supplies without Torga, they definitely will. So they'll run away on these dog sleds. One of the most ingenious plays I've seen in this scenario was we had a halfling rogue. What she did was she buried within the snow and she undid each of the straps of the dog sleds before the encounter took place. So Sephic and Torga couldn't run away. The way I did that was a really easy DC-10 sleight of hand check to undo the knots to release these beasts and also an animal handling check just to make sure they don't get these wolves too angry. As in my understanding with these uh, sled dogs, I would say they're more like domesticated wolves. They're loyal to their masters but they might be aggressive to other people. The other thing I did was I made Torga look a little bit more evil again by showing these dogs in neglect. So they had roughed up far, they're malnourished because she cares more about her profit than she cares about feeding these dogs. One thing I find with uh, my players is that when you deal with animals, they treat animals in D&D a lot better than they treat people. In the comment section below, let me know if your players do the same thing. So I've talked about the bandits, I've talked about Torga, so let's talk about Sephic and how you're going to run him in combat. So with Sephic Altro, the main thing you have to understand is that he's undead, he has spellcasting, and if you run him correctly, he should be a difficult fight. He has regeneration. It is always below zero degrees Fahrenheit with an Iron Swindale, unless he's in a tavern in front of a fire. So he will gain five hit points at the start of each round, and if he takes fire damage, this won't happen, and this will reset at the beginning of his next turn. And he dies only if he t starts his turn with zero hit points and he doesn't regenerate. Which means that if you cannot do fire damage to Sephic, he will not die. And you have to make this very apparent to your characters. Get low levels, they won't have much supplies and options. With his spellcasting ability, he has Misty Step and he do it three times a day. Combat at this level of D&D should only take two or three rounds. So every single round he should be trying to use his Misty Step to get away from melee focused players and attack people who are bad in melee. He is quite intelligent. So his strongest attack will be his Ice Longsword, which is two-handed, and he'll be doing that twice. As it specifies in the multi-action, he attacks twice with a weapon. It doesn't specify if it's range or melee. So if he can, he's going to run in and he's going to do two-handed attacks, 1d10 plus 3 slashing damage, and 2d4 cold damage. If he cannot get within melee, he's going to chuck two ice daggers, and both these weapons count for magical damage, which won't really come up much in our levels of D&D, but it's good to know. So he's going to attack, teleport, attack, and he's going to make it difficult for your players to pin him down. Another thing to mention it with Sephic, before going deeper with this, if he's approached by your player characters and they ask him about the murders of the Icewind Dale, he's not guilty about it, as in you quite happily tell the information. Because he's proud that he's killing these people in the sake of all the Frost Maiden. At early levels, this can easily become a TPK. And if you kill your player characters at a really early level, you get to a situation where it's not fun losing all the time. So what I'll do is, if Sephic was to jump into combat and slay one or two of your player characters, I'd have these bandits either run away, 
or they might try to steal the dog sleds away from Toriga, as in four of these bandits might take on their captain and try to run Tor's caravan themselves. Another thing to prevent a TPK is you can always tell your player characters before your session begins that running away is always an option. And that's one of the reasons why I typically run this encounter out of the town, because if worst comes to worst, I'd have the town be maybe 120 feet away to the north, which means in two turns they can dash and get there. They also have large walls outside Ceres towns such as Targos and Bransander, where the town guard might help them. So with Tor's Caravan, how do you guys run it? Give me some tips in the comment section below. And guys, if you do enjoy this content, remember to like and subscribe. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to jump in and answer your questions. And I'll see you shortly. Time to look at the comments from last week's episode. So the general consensus seems to be War and Deep Dragon Heists, which from my experience was an experience to run. Combining four campaigns into one can be a headache for any Rust DM. There will be some videos on this in the future. I also like the suggestion for other campaigns such as Descent into Avarice and Snow King's Thunder. And again guys, thank you so much for your support. Remember, if you do like this content, remember to like and subscribe and there is a Patreon link in the description below. On the next episode, we're going to jump right in the end of Icewind Dale and we're going to discuss the Spire of Irulandus. <laughs> Don't worry if you can't pronounce you his name, I couldn't either. I used to call him Angry Skullboy. <laughs> Stay tuned and we'll see you in the next one. Ciao!